So today I'm going to be showing off how I made hover feedback for tiles in Godot only using shader code. The main benefit with doing this using shaders only is that tile maps in Godot are kind of annoying to manipulate in code. To see if I clicked on a tile is easy because I can take the mouse position and just use the tilemap.getCellTile data function which will return null if the tile doesn't exist but if it does exist I can just check whether it's in the range of movement that I want to have. But I don't just want to be able to like press on a tile. I want to make it obvious that you can actually press on a tile and the best way to do that is with some sort of like hover feedback. So to do this in code would mean that I would have to know the mouse position at all times and then check if I'm over tile, change that tile to an alternate tile that has a certain like hover texture or modulated or a different shade or whatever. And once I leave that tile I have to now re change that tile back into its original form and that feels like it's going to be very hard to do and it feels really annoying and because the hover feedback is only just for visuals and only the user needs to know it this feels unnecessary to me so I made a shader which would take in the mouse position as a uniform and then use that to see if the mouse position is within the bounds this is really easy for a square where I know the exact length and width which is what this tile map is going to be. So let's start. Um, and I'm just going to add a sprite for a random character that we're going to have. And we're going to give him welcome to a demo jellyfish. This is a demo jellyfish. Ooh, OK, there you go. And let's make his texture nearest okay and now this is the start of the show this is the tile map and for this tile map I'm going to be using a tile set that's going to be used in a hopefully up and coming game let me make a new tile set we're here add the tile uh, I want 64 by 64 tiles this should be 64 by 64 there you go. Now I'm just gonna like, you know, paint a little box. Well, it's not here. There we go. And let's put it behind the sprite, the main player. And I'm just gonna put a camera 2D to center it, to center the camera on our tile map. Now if we run the game, so the current scene. We can see that we have a scene with nothing in it except a tile map and a player. Uh, we can't press on any tile yet, which is fine, and we don't know that we can press on a tile. It doesn't like feel like that. So to do this, I'm going to go into the tile set, and by the way, these textures are not mine. They are my uh, co-developers, or the like the artist of the team. Um, anyways, we're going to use this. We're going to go select a tile. And we're going to go to rendering, add a material. It's going to be a new shader material. So I'm going to save, call it uh, tile select material. And tile select material is going to have a shader. It's going to go tile select shader. Very creative with names. And then let's just open this over here. And let's just change the color. Oh, we have, we have a debugger. I forgot to do something. Expected. Oh. Uh, as you can see, this is invisible. Why is it invisible? Because I forgot that I set the alpha to zero. So let's just set this to two so we can kind of see it. And look at that. It's a blank square. Uh, well, it's a red square that's mostly uh, transparent. Damn it. So. We have this red square, but the thing is we need a tile select shader, and we're not going to need this for later. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to delete this, and what we need to do for tile select is basically take our global mouse position, which will pass in as a uniform from a script, and also we need to have to pass the vertex position 
from our vertex shader to our fragment shader because the vertex shader contains the vertex positions which is basically where each of these corners are located of any given tile and then we're going to compare them in the fragment shader where we can change the color but the problem is in the vertex shader itself we don't actually have the global space coordinates if we do render mode skip vertex transform we can see that this is not what we expect but this is the value that the vertex shader has when we call void vertex and that's the value we would be passing in and the way to fix this is actually going to be it's on the docs also for canvas item shader what we do is we have to take this and we're going to do the transformations ourselves which on the doc is mo model matrix times back for of vertex 0 0.0 uh, 1.0 and then take the xy what this does is applies the model matrix which is all of the transformations we need to do and all the matrices we need to apply to get from our local space coordinates which is those weird coordinates you saw over there which didn't make sense in the editor to our actual global coordinates which is ranging from wherever this is on the top of the screen to wherever the bottom right of the screen is we don't need to set this transformation mode for this shader but this shows the actual like formula that we need to apply to get the correct vertex position the global vertex position so to pass data from oh that's funny uh, you can see the model matrix being applied twice but anyways to pass data from the frag the vertex data to the fragment data we're going to use something called a varying and a varying, the varying keyword just allows us to pass stuff from the vertex of the fragment shader. And we're going to make a vec2 array. We're going to call it vertex pause. And now we have this variable that we can write to. What we're going to do now is we're going to take vertex position of 0 and we're going to set it equal to that transformation we did before, which is uh, model matrix times vec4 of vertex 0.0, 0 0.1. Oh, oh 1.0. Oh, I almost tripped myself up. Okay. Now, we're going to be passing in the global coordinates of the vertex into the fragment shader, where now we can actually mess with it. And the other thing we're going to need is going to be the uniform. And this uniform is going to be a vec2 of global mouse position. Now, some of you may have spotted a weird little bug that we're going to have later. And that's because varying variables are actually interpolated for every vertex position. So they're going to be interp the the array itself is going to be interpolated from each vertex uh, for each fragment shader. So like a, val uh, a fragment shader that's in the middle of these two vertexes is going to be like halfway between both, which is not what we want. What we want is we want a flat. And making it flat just stops us from stops it from interpolating it for us because we don't want interpolation. Now, we're going to need a script to test this out. So, I'm going to get back to you when I get done with the script. Because uh, I'm making this in GD script, but I don't know GD script, so hold up. Okay, after looking at documentation for five minutes, I have uh, figured out that the onReady keyword exists. Anyways, so now we have a simple script on our main character sprite. And all that does is it loads the tile select material and the reason we need that is because the tile select material if you actually go on to it after we added the uniform up over here it's actually part of oh, it did not there you go it is actually over here under shader parameters which you can set using set shader parameter with global mouse position being global mouse position now that's that's easy now let's see what happens when 
we set the color to be color dot r equal to the step oh to the step of let's say our vertex position of zero dot x and our global mouse position dot x. Oh, that is trippy. Don't know why it's all. Oh, it's because the global mouse position is set at zero zero. Uh, if you look at this, you can see that it becomes white when our mouse crosses over this border. And to make sure that this is not the opposite of what we want, and that somehow this, because we're always setting it to the, the first index, to make sure that we're not setting it to like the bottom right corner or something, anywhere on the right, let's just comment out this line and set color.r to equal to, uh, let's say, just one pointer. It's fully white. And if we set it to 0, .0 it's fully blue. And the reason for this is because when we set it to 0, we're taking out all of the red, which only leaves us the blue and the green. So that makes sense. So now, we almost have what we need. What we need now is to take our vertex or to take our vertex position and our global mouse position and do all the comparisons. So now let's make two variables. So this is going to be uh, is within y and flow is within x. And this I'm going to do whatever with. This is not going to be set late to right now. Ooh. So equals, so now what we need to do is we're going to take our vertex pause of zero. I just realized it doesn't need to be an array. I don't know why I made it an array. Anyways, let's take, this is our vertex position y. So let's take our y position. And we're going to take our global mouse pause dot y. We're going to also multiply this by our vertex pause of zero dot y uh, is actually going to be the first parameter should be global mouse pause this one uh, and then we're going to add 64 which means we're going down and we're going to also do global mouse pause oh, 64 dot got to remember the dot zero or else it gets mad at you global mouse position dot y Oh, and we're not actually setting that anywhere. We're going to set that over is within y. So as you see, this is not working exactly as expected. And that's because, well, I messed up. Um, I just wanted to get this down really quick. So this is the top position. And this is going to be like, let's say, up this corner. And once our mouse gets under it, that means it's going to be greater. So this line of code is fine. But for the bottom one, we're basically just checking the same thing, but we're moving it forward. So what we want to do is we want to take this one. We're actually going to move this over here. And it deleted the dot. Remember the dot. Now, we're only selecting one row at a time. This is really easily extrapolated to uh, is within, ooh, why did I do that? Is within x. And we're just going to set it to over here, and this can die. No, fine. There we go. Let's set all of these to x. And if we do is with an x, this works perfectly. So now what we want to do is we're going to take a float called is within which we could have just combined all of them, but I just, I just like doing it this way because it makes it more clear to read and is within X. So this will only be one when our tile is actually being highlighted. So let's set color to the mix between the current color, actually not color, uh, hold up. First, what we need to do is actually sample the texture because if we're just gonna do the color mixing, it's gonna look weird and we actually want it to be only for uh, the texture that way you're mixing between the textures then it doesn't just like wash out the color weirdly like if you remember when we set the color uh the color to like let's just set it to like you know set the same thing right so we're 1.0 1.0 1.0 1.0 1.0 1.0 1.0 1.0 1.0 1.0 1.0 1.0 1.0 1.0 1.0 1.0 1.0 1.0 1.0 1.0 1
and vec3 of 0.2. You see how the borders disappear? That's what would happen with us. So what we need to do now is we're going to get our vec4. We're going to make a vec4, which is going to call texture color. And we're going to sample our texture. Oh, let's go texture. There. Texture. I'm failing at typing, guys. Okay. And we're going to sample our UV. So nothing has happened. And if we set color equal to texture color, did I miss an E? That makes me so angry. Yeah. Okay. Nothing happens. But now what we can do is we can take the mix function and we're going to do, like, let's say uh, a vec of 0. Point, uh, actually 1 0. Point, I guess 8 0. 0.0 0. 0.0 1.0 and then we're gonna make it 1 this just makes it red oh that is blinding red I'm gonna actually lower that slightly let's make it 7 what if we make this 0. 0.5 let's make it 7 also and now we have everything highlighted. Now, we don't want everything highlighted. We only want what's within to be highlighted. So one first approach would be multiplying the entire thing by is within. Uh, ooh, yeah. Now, this doesn't really work because you're setting the entire vector to zero instead of only. So what happens over here is instead of only using the texture color when you multiply everything by is within you basically just set color to a vector 4 with 0 0 0 and 0 which gives this really cool effect where you like have invisible tiles which I think is really cool but that's not what we're after so the easy way to fix this is actually we're moving this parentheses outside and this will be weird because our global mouse position at 0 0 but if you let's go into the editor that is full, perfect highlighting. If you stuck around till the end of the video, which I'm pretty sure like 3% of you are going to be, but if you're one of those 3%, good on you. Anyways, if you stuck along this far, uh, I want you to know that the whole reason that I was trying to figure out that shader is because me and a couple of friends are trying to make a game called Paracelsus, uh, which is gonna be a card playing game based off of the chemistry and uh, we're going to do devlogs on this hopefully pretty soon, but you can see that I've implemented this tile select onto these tiles. They have slight transparency and they look really cool. Um, so yeah, that's that's something if you want to get excited for learning about this game, we're hopefully going to start posting stuff on that. Uh, this is kind of like a fun project that I didn't think I'd ever be able to do. I never thought I'd understand game dev, and here I am making shaders. Uh, even the if I run this game again and let's play even this is just done with a shader before it used to actually be like a gradient shader but now it's not uh, and I think this is just really cool uh, so if you want to support this I guess just follow it and that's gonna be that